Turn your Bibles to Ruth tonight, Ruth chapter number one, and uh, Monday afternoon, I had a heaviness set on me, and you men know what that means. I uh, I knew Brother Burke had asked me to come in on Sunday and preach, and then help with the music and my family sing throughout the week, and so that's what I prepared for, and uh, I'll be honest with you, I do not expect to do nothing. I don't care if my name's on the flyer, if my name's on the sign. This stuff is of the Lord, men. Amen? You ought to be prepared, but you ought not get your feelings hurt if it's not you called on. And uh, the reason why you might not get called on, because you think it's all about you. Are you listening to me? This ain't about you. This ain't about me. It's about Him. And uh, I, uh, I appreciate the young men, I appreciate Brother Ben praying for me. I wanted my boys to pray for me. They pray for me with none of y'all around. <laughs> it's in a church in Kentucky and it was hard. Real hard. Fifteen million demons and devils running around. So bad we got up to sing one song, Brother David, and I asked my family to sit down and I sang a couple by myself because I didn't want to put them through it. I'm talking about just choke. You could choke on the demons. It's so heavy in there. And uh, I was sitting there. And this has been five, six years ago. No, it was probably 10 or 11. I was sitting on the front row. And they was about to call me up. There was a group up there singing. And uh, the preacher asked for prayer. So I closed my eyes. And I'm telling you, I was thinking about getting my family and walking out during the prayer. Brother Lamance, it was that bad. But I knew I was in a battle. And I felt a hand touch my knee. I looked down, Brother Tim, and it was Noah. He said, God help Daddy. When he said that, ten billion angels flooded my soul. We got up there and preached, and God helped us. We got in the car. Got back to the camper, and I said, Noah... I said, son, you'll never know. You'll never know. I said, why did you pray for daddy tonight? He said, daddy, I saw you as in a war. You can think what you want to think. I ain't trying to be, I ain't trying to work your emotions. I'm just telling you, I thank God that my boys are with me in the ministry. We found ourselves at a little hay bale out there and I thank God for my family. And I want them to know that this thing is real. And uh, me and Mama are what we are here, what we are at the hotel, what we are at home. And uh, I appreciate my kids tonight. And I thank God for them. And I thank God for their spirits. I told Brother Dean the other day, and I don't mean this wrong, uh, we believe in discipline. Talk to me now. I'm going somewhere. I need help tonight. Help keep the devils off our mind tonight. We believe in discipline. And so we go to places. And I teach my children to be servants. It ain't brown nosing. It ain't trying to suck up to the preacher. It ain't trying to get another meeting. I teach them to be servants. And because they're servants, we go to places that they take advantage of them. But I still teach them it don't matter. We're not doing it for the people. Are you listening to me? And we'll go to places, and it, and it bum fuzzles me, Brother David. They'll ask my kids to do something while their kids are standing there. Noah, will you take out the trash? And they got a 15-year-old boy standing right beside Noah. So I started to work on some of that behind the scenes. I said, Brother, I'm glad you knew Noah would take out the trash, but what was wrong with your boy standing there? <laughs> See, what happened is if he'd asked his boy to take out the trash, he'd have got lip and embarrassed in front of everybody. Talk to me now. Let's me know that things ain't right in the home. Your children are a product of you. <laughs> I ain't tooting our horn. You hang around us long enough, you'll find out we got problems. I'm just trying to tell you, your children are a product of you. And the reason why they'll embarrass you at church because they'll embarrass you at home and you won't do nothing about it. I learned a long time ago when I was a young boy, Mom and Daddy said, you're going to embarrass me, we going to embarrass you, boy. I'm not going to be the one embarrassed. The whole restaurant may be embarrassed by the time I get finished. But I thank God for my children. And I explained to them, Brother Adam, we don't do this for y'all. 
We do what we do for Him. We do it whether we're in a church with two or, or two thousand. We're going to be the same. And I hope my kids get a hold of this thing. And I want to challenge you families. Are you listening to me with young children? These days will pass. Miss Leah back there wrestling all them little babies. And then her oldest ones praise for unction. You keep doing it, sis. <laughs> keep on wrestling them. Take them out, spank them, bring them back in. That's all right. Don't bring them to go play. Teach them how to act in church. Don't give them your phone. Not the babysitter. Are everybody okay? I ain't trying to be ugly or not. I know the Lord's here, but there's some things that need to be in order. And the home is where it starts. The reason why our churches are out of order is because our homes are out of order. I thank God for their mother. You know why Mallory acts like a lady? Because her mama acts like a lady. Are you listening to me? I thank God for my wife. I didn't have a life like yours. I was raised in church, but I promise you, I still married way up. I've been picking on Brother David all week about he ain't. I told his wife, I said, you should have seen the clothes he's wore all week. <laughs> Wrinkled, stained. She said, it don't surprise me. He said, boy, he told me, he said, boy, I, I'm spoiled. He said, I come home, dinner on the table and clothes iron for church. And I thank God for it. Ladies, you're not under the man. But you're supposed to be under the man. My pastor said the Lord didn't take a woman from the heel of a foot so she could be trampled upon. But he also didn't take it from a bone from the head so she could rule. Instead, he took it from his side so she could be a help me. And I bless the Lord for it tonight. I really need the Lord's help tonight because there is not enough personality and not enough charisma. Although... Some of them boys think that's what it's about. Some of you men need to learn to decipher the difference between charisma and unction from the Lord. There's a difference. You young people don't flock to all these boys that are pretty and, and doing all these things that seem to have a touch of God. You say you feel the Lord on these things. You watch their life and their fruit, what they produce. Talk to me now. <laughs> This thing ain't about feeling. Thank God we can feel some things. And I felt it tonight, but it's not about feeling. Our circle, that, that, and I hate him calling it that, but y'all know what I mean. Our circle is full of feelings. Get tore up during the song service and then can't do nothing during the preaching. Run to the altar during the song service, but you ain't ran to the altar in a long time when God convict you during preaching. We got these certain little songs that we know to sing. Ain't no different a country music concert or rock concert. Talk to me now. All in our circles, and it's a shame. And I'll be honest with you, our young people can't hardly tell the difference between us and them because of it. <laughs> oh yeah. They can't tell the difference. But there's a difference in your fruits. In your day-to-day life. But when I bless the Lord for it. You and Ruth say amen. amen. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. I began looking and this afternoon I had been studying. The Lord has given me several things. God's going to have to preach this how He wants tonight and, and cater it to however it needs. I've got several messages into one. And uh, I'm a alliterated person. I've always liked to alliterate. And I like an outline, but God's begun to change my preaching in the last year or two, not to rely on my outline. Find the inline and get in that. Amen. <laughs> and it's helped me. It's not, that, a matter of fact, I was in a place a while back, and I'll be honest with you, I was kind of disgusted. A man that I love, a man that I look to and has helped me in years gone past, I was in a place, and it was a Wednesday night, and I had done preached. And you men know what I mean by this. I felt like I preached everything I knew by Wednesday night. I had hundreds of messages, but I just felt like I was preached out. And he called me, and he said, uh, he said, I told him what was going on. He said, Brother Josh, just find a good polished message and just go in there and preach that. I said, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. 
He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm not going there to preach nothing polished. And I went in there that night and God gave me one verse to preach. I felt inadequate. I felt like a scattered, sawed-off shotgun. But turns out that's what God wanted. And God used it. Nobody walked away talking about the message that Josh Adams preached. They walked away talking about what God done. And that's my intent. So tonight I'm going to have to have the Lord uh, to help us here. But I begin to study this thing of famines. You men of God, you can talk to me later. Don't, don't do it now. But I cannot find in the Word of God where a famine ever killed a child of God. Wrote some things down this afternoon. I'm not preaching here, but I want to explain to you some things that take place. The first famine mentioned in Scripture was when God compelled and asked Abraham to go down to the Philistine land of Egypt. First famine ever mentioned. Another mention, the next mention is when Isaac, God calls Isaac to go to Gerar where he became rich and powerful. There's a very remarkable famine mentioned uh, that arose in Egypt when Joseph, that famine lasted for seven years. As I begin to study the famines, and I'm not saying it's all, but as of right now, every mention of famine calls somebody to move. Every mention that I've studied so far, famines, calls to people to move directions to move places. Here we find that this famine caused them to go to Moab. I want to tell you tonight, be careful where your famine takes you. Be very careful what direction the famine is taking you tonight. I begin to study this word famine. I begin to look at the word famine and the definition is a lack of food during a long period of time in a certain region. A famine. And as I begin to study, I only looked at four or five this afternoon and you'll have to forgive me because that's not where my heart is desired tonight. But I'm going to tell you something. We experience famine in our day. We experience famine in our lifetime. And don't get to pity party and don't get to looking down. Everybody experiences famine. And Elimelech decided to take his family to a place. Joseph's famine helped his family. Elimelech's famine hurt his family. Be careful, daddies, where you're taking your family during a famine. A famine could be described as a dry time, a dry season, a wintry, dark, dark season where nothing is growing. A famine. Do you know sometimes our marriages experience famine? You know how many people bust up in the marriage when things aren't going like they always go? Do you know our churches experience famine? Talk to me now. Help me. I need your help tonight. Famine. Be careful where your famine takes you. The Bible said they went to the sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judea, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. You know the story. This is a very popular uh, thing to preach on. You understand that everybody has preached on Ruth. I have nothing new to bring you tonight, but I do got a burden that God has put on my heart. Let me tell you something. You be careful where your famine takes you. Are you listening to me? You might think it's just a small little stroll in the park. Are you listening to me? A living lake was probably not intending to be there. But he got stuck there. And the problem is, here in a few verses, Naomi is fixing to have to make a choice. She's about to have to choose off of choices that she did not make. Do you know how many peoples in life and churches and different places are choosing from choices they did not make? Are you listening to me? And Naomi's husband died. 
Let me tell you something. <laughs> if your famine takes you to the wrong place, you better be careful because God will kill you. And they, and she was left, her and her two sons. You know, one of the, one of the biggest things that drive me to stay in the will of God is my family. I don't want to drop Amber and Noah and Mallory and Jonah off out of the will of God somewhere. Are you listening to me, mamas and daddies? It's very, very, very important. Brother Adam, I know some of the struggles you've been through out there in Kansas. But it's the will of God. <laughs> They've come in and they've walked out. They've walked out more than they've come in. But the will of God is for you to be in Kansas. You start to see a little light at the end of the tunnel. Your little boy's praying for unction for the man of God. <laughs> it's very important that you don't leave your family out of the will of God. <laughs> Are you listening to me? God's wanting to help somebody tonight. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the women was left of her two sons and her husband. And she arose with her daughters-in-law, that they might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab... How that the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. I have in the leaf of my Bible who told her that. Let me tell you something. God's always got a preacher somewhere. God's always got a preacher. Somebody passed through Moab and said, I don't know if y'all heard, but there's bread plenty. Are you listening to me? Let me tell you this before I get to preaching where I want to preach. If you ever find yourself in Moab, you can always go back to Bethlehem, Judea. <laughs> if you ever find yourself in Moab, you can always go back to Bethlehem, Judea. You say, why is that? Because there's bread that's plenty. There's a book that's preached. There's a beloved that's praised. And there's a Boaz that's powerful. Talk to me now. If you ever find yourself in Moab, you can go back to Bethlehem of Judea. Are you listening to me tonight? There might be some young person. There might be some young man. There might be some young woman that has found their self in Moab. I want to tell you tonight, you can come back. Brother Dana Williams said, aren't you glad when the prodigal son decided to come home that he didn't come home to tall weeds and boarded up windows? There's bread that's plenty in Moab. There's still a book that's preached, a beloved that's praised. And there's a Boaz that's real powerful. <laughs> You'll come back to Boab, from Moab to Bethlehem. We all know the story. The Bible said, wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, in verse 7, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her, two daughter-in-laws, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them. And they lifted up their voice and wept. Let me tell you something. You'll cause people tears and heartache when you're out of the will of God. Are you listening to me? And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee. Are you listening to me? They said, Ruth and Orpah, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that ye may uh, be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, and if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Watch this, and they lifted up their voice 
and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. The people, thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. We live in a victim mentality world today. Everywhere we go, people act like they're the victim. Tonight, we could say this. We could say that Naomi had a huge part in Orpah going back. Are you listening to me? Be careful of your testimony and your influences with others. Because Naomi, we could say that Naomi had a big part in Orpah going back. But I want to tell you tonight that Ruth heard the same story as Orpah did. And you can't blame others. Listen to me. You can't blame others how you make decisions on going back. My question tonight, my burden tonight is, what happened to Orpah? What happened to Orpah? Now, this is only my second year to come to a meeting. But there are churches that we go in year in and year out, Miss Tanya. And the Lord has allowed us to build rapport with God's people. Boy, I'm ever so thankful for God's people tonight. And I go into places and I say things to pastors. What happened to so-and-so? What There was a man that sat on the right side that had a red hair and had a red... What happened to so-and-so? Only to see a pastor hang his head. I was in a meeting just a month ago. And I get a phone call that brother so-and-so has fallen. My question is, what happened to Orpah? Now, for you Bible studies, there's not a lot mentioned in this chapter about Orpah, brother. The only thing mentioned is she went unto her little gods and to her family. But I began to look at some decisions. And why did Orpah make a decision to go back tonight? What what convinced Orpah to go back? I began to look and I realized one thing. She had weeping companions. She had weeping companions. Do you know how many people make decisions when they're emotional? Talk to me now. She had weeping companions. You said, but Josh, why were they weeping? They was weeping because of death. But I'll tell you something. Death visits all of us. Next week, we'll go to Brother Tory Dismukes, where he buried his wife. <laughs> you know what I asked God? No, ain't it such a blessing, Brother Dean, that God brought me and you here? We'll be there next week to a deep well to fill us up and bring us down to Florida and dump us out next week. <laughs> I want to be so full of God when I go in there, when I touch him, he gets help. Don't look at me crazy. I ain't trying to be ugly. I'm trying to, he needs help, Brother David. He, you said you couldn't make it without her. He's having to do that tonight. Three teenage kids at home. They're hurting. And I ask God to fill us up so big when we walk in there. I want to leave there completely empty. Don't be whining when God empties you out somewhere. You ask to be used and God uses you and you cry on Facebook and social media and tell everybody how, how emptied out you are. I asked God a while ago on my friends. I prayed over everybody I could up here. I said, God, fill Adam Lakeson up. Bring him to Kansas and dump him out. God, fill Ben Watson up and everywhere he goes, dump him out. God, fill Daniel Bryan up and bring him to Africa and dump him out. You stay full, you'll get to walking around telling everybody how full you are. Talk to me now. Huh? Everybody experiences death. Everybody experiences discouragement. They was crying because they was discouraged. Everybody experiences discouragement. Everybody experiences defeat. Talk to me. She had weeping companions. Can I tell you something? You can't make decisions while you're emotional. Not only did she have weeping companions, she had wrong counsel. Talk to me. She was counseling with somebody, Naomi, that was bitter. 
You can't counsel with people that are bitter. Talk to me. You won't counsel, go to your man of God. Huh? Don't go to somebody that's bitter and out of church and got some old sour outfit. You won't counsel, go to your man of God. She just counseled with somebody that was bitter. She just counseled with somebody that was broken. Broken. Are you listening to me? Then she was counseling with somebody that was barren. Naomi had done told them, I've got nothing to give to you. You can't counsel with people like that. She had wrong counsel. You know, it amazes me traveling. People will get my number, Brother Tim. They'll call me. Boy, I thank God that the Lord's given me a good enough testimony for somebody thinking of me to call me. Are you listening to me? I don't mean that ugly. I don't mean that prideful. But I thank the Lord. A lot of times I ain't got no answers. And I tell them. I don't make up nothing. But a preacher called me one time. Preacher boy. And his pastor done giving some advice to do. And I could tell when he called me. He said, brother, if you don't mind, if you could just keep this between us. And I sniffed it out real quick. I said, I want you to know, buddy, before we ever start talking. But I keep a lot of things between me and you. But I ain't keeping nothing between me and you confidential that I ain't going to tell your pastor. Talk to me now. Because that's exactly what he's doing. Guess he didn't, he didn't talk to me about nothing. You know why? Because he's wanting to go against his pastor. Wrong counsel. Everybody wants marriage counsel. My pastor said, my Amber's, Amber's daddy pastored us. He said, you want marriage counsel for six months. Don't miss a service. Then come back to me at the end of that six months. We'll still see if you need marriage counsel. See, the problem is your marriage counsel was here Wednesday night and you didn't come to church. Most marriage counsels only want somebody to listen to their side. That's all they want. My wife's daddy, my pastor, and I want to thank God for him tonight. I thank God for my man of God. Are you listening to me? You ought to thank God if you got a real man of God. He said, uh, they, ain't, they ain't one problem two Christians can't work out. He said, the problem is finding two Christians. They ain't one. They ain't one. I'll tell you something. Wrong counsel. You be careful who you counsel with. Are you listening to me? You want counsel? Find your pastor and find some old men of God that hang around him and find counsel. Brother Tim and Miss Cassie was praying about what to do and my advice was to him, don't, don't talk to a lot of people because they will mess you up. You trying to find the will of God, everybody knows the will of God for you and they can't even figure out what they're supposed to do. Oh, it's amazing to me. Are you listening? It's amazing to me how many people think they know the will of God for other people's lives. She had wrong counsel. She had worldly compromise. Evidently, how did Naomi know what she was going back to? Evidently, Orpah had been talking. Talk to me. She said she's going back to her family. She knew that, but then she said she's going back to her little G gods. She had some bad discussions. I tell you, when you start talking different, you know what's in your heart comes out. Me and Brother Dean was talking to a preacher the other day with his pastor. And we was talking and prodding and asking questions and all that kind of stuff and some things come out of him. Are you listening to me? When you're poked and prodded, what's in you is coming out. You can't hide it from nobody. Not only did she have bad discussion, she had a bad decision. Are you listening to me? She chose to go back. She had bad dedication. I began to look at it. And I wrote this down. I feel like Orpah was obligated to go with Naomi. But Ruth was dedicated to go with Naomi. How many of y'all are coming to church because you feel obligated? It's a big difference. I've got over the obligation a long time ago, Sam. I want to be dedicated. My preacher told me that we ought to have the tenacity of a bulldog. You ever seen a pit bull lock on something? you got to get a stick to break its mouth off. My preacher said some of y'all need to get some, some, some Velcro and stick it to your backside and on your pew. Get some stickability about you. Amen. Are you listening to me? Orpah went back. I don't want to go back. 
Amen. But Ruth clave under Naomi. Yeah. And there's some things that you'll have if you'll go all the way. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Naomi, now Ruth went all the way with Naomi. Are you listening to me tonight? But Orpah went back. And there's some things that Ruth is fixing to get to experience yeah. <laughs> that she never would have got to experience if she did not go all the way. So, out of obligation, Orpah ended up going back. But out of dedication, Ruth ended up going all the way. Now, I'm about done. If that's what the Lord wants, but listen to me. Ruth's dedicated decision. Ruth said something like this in country boy terms. I ain't listening no more to you telling me we're going back. I'm going with you. Where you go, I'm going. Where you eat, it's what I'm eating. Where you lay down, is where I'm laying down. Are you listening to me? Her dedicated decision. She clave. Because of Ruth going all the way, she got to experience God's praise. Do you know that Judah means praise? Let me tell you something. If you'll go with God, you'll get to experience God's praise. Not only did she get to experience God's praise, she got to experience God's presence. Verse 6 said that the Lord had visited them in Bethlehem of Judea. Do you know going with God, I get to experience His presence? And it ain't just in church every night. We experienced it in the hotel practicing a song yesterday. We experienced it going down the road. You can ask my kids, it ain't no put on, it ain't no show. We have church in the car. We had church in the studio the other day recording our CD. (laughs) Are you listening to me? Got to experience God's presence. I feel sorry for people that only experience God when they're at church. Matter of fact, you might think I'm crazy. Some of the sweetest times I've ever had with God, I wasn't in a church building. I was in in the truck of the car. I was in some hotel laying on the floor. God's presence. And not only did she get to experience God's presence because she went all the way, she got to experience God's provisions. <laughs> I'm like that little song that said, every need supplied. We've come here this week and I've tried my best to give out financially. I don't say that to toot my horn. I'm just trying to tell you, I tried my best. We've got needs and my needs and what I got ain't sufficient. So there ain't no sense of me keeping what I got anyway. Talk to me. And I've got $100 handshake after $100 handshake. Leaving the hotel a while ago, a man ran me down. Threw a $100 bill in the window. You said, Brother Josh, nothing like that ever happens to me. Why? I asked Brother Adam, and I ain't trying to embarrass him. I said, Brother Adam, y'all okay? I said, I ain't got much, but I'll split it with you. I meant that. I meant it with all my heart. He said, but Josh, seven, four people walked up to me tonight and gave me money. You know what that is? That's God's provision. He's so faithful. He can't help but be faithful. That's who he is. It don't say God does faithful. God is faithful. It's in his DNA. The Bible doesn't say God does love. It said he is love. It's who he is. He can't help but do it. God's provision. And then because she went all the way, she got to experience God's people. She'd been in Moab. She had never been around people like God's people. I was at a church a few months ago, and a guy said, My goodness. said, I love them ostrich boots you got on. I said, Brother, I do too. He said, Where'd you get them? I said, God's people. He said, Boy, them shiny black. I said, I got a brown pair too. But Lamont's God's people have been so good to me. You pull up at my driveway at my house and look, and everywhere you look, it's God and God's people. Talk to me now. I got a lot of lawnmower. It don't mean much to y'all. 48 inch Kubota lawnmower. God provided. <laughs> got 13 acres over there and I was wanting a tractor. Couldn't afford to pay my gas bill, but I was wanting a tractor so bad. It might not seem much to you, but it meant a lot to me. I wanted a tractor. My preacher stepped down from our church, and they had given him a tractor ten years ago. And where they got property in Texas, they only got about a half an acre. He said, Brother Josh, just bring that tractor 
Kubota, four-wheel drive, front-end loader, little 32-horse tractor. Are you listening to me? He said, just bring it to your house, and when I decide what I need to do with it, I'll let you know. He said, just use it like it's yours. Well, I didn't use it like it was mine. Because it wasn't mine. I said, Lord, if this thing breaks, I ain't got the money to fix it. So he said, okay. He said, I ain't going to need it. He said, "Uh, I'll just sell it to you if you want it. I said, okay, preacher. I said, I'm hoping you'll own or finance. Talk to me now. I said, I'll give you what I can. He said, well, he said, you got a few dollars? I said, what you mean? He said, I need to give me a few dollars. And that's what you're going to buy it for. I said, no, preacher, we ain't going down like that. He said, oh, no, son. He said, I'm going to give that to you. You and the boys use on the property. <laughs> God's people. My kids have lived on the right. I ain't telling no sob story, so don't you come up here thinking I'm sobbing. Don't even come up here thinking, no, God's been good to us. Amen. We live on the road. We live on the mission field. And Jonah was born there. We got our little piece of property. And they said, Daddy, I wish I had a four-wheeler. It killed me on the inside, Brother Adam, because I wanted to provide for him. But I was broke. Jonah had his first birthday at our home. That little woman back there lived in the camper for five years and never complained. She did. She did it to the kids. I ain't never heard it. Jonah had his first birthday in our home. We've always celebrated birthdays, just like Miss Lori. At church. And I appreciate you, sis. My wife went today, drove an hour, and I ain't trying to brag on her. She said, I want to go get Miss Lori something. I want to make Miss Lori a little basket. Put a few things in it. Are you listening? Because it's special that she's celebrating her birthday here. And I hope before the night's out, if we don't do it collectively, individually, she, she can't carry her purse out of here. Talk to me now. I'm talking about reach for them big boys and give it to her. Pull it up. And somebody said, Brother Cody Tucker brought his four-wheeler to ride. He said, you mind if I give Jonah a four-wheeler? I said, are you serious? He said, I'm, I'm serious. I said, it's fine. Jonah come running inside. He said, Daddy... I got a four-wheeler. I said, do what? He said, Daddy, Brother Cody gave me a four-wheeler. <laughs> I was preaching in Mississippi. Went to a man's house. We were talking. He said, Brother Josh, he said, your kids got anything right over at your house? I said, yes, sir. I said, duh. So the last week, a preacher friend of mine gave Jonah a four-wheeler. He said, well, I got another Honda Foreman 450 down there in the shed. He said, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what's wrong with it. He said, but it, it probably ain't much. He said, won't you just load that up? I said, are you serious? He said, I'm serious. I said, okay. So I told Noah, I said, now pull my truck down there. I said, is my jump box in the truck? He said, yes, sir. I said, go get it. I said, I said, you got any gas? He said, he said, I'm telling you, he said, that thing's probably messed up. I said, it might be. Honest before the Lord. We put gas in it, hooked the jumper cables to it, and it didn't turn over two times, and that thing cranked. And it looks raggedy. It looks like we stole it. We didn't. If you pull up to our house, there's a little red Honda Foreman. It's faded, but you know what it is? It's God's provision from God's people. I never met nobody like God's people. I never met nobody like God's people. Noah turned 15. I wanted to provide for him. He should get his license. But Brother Adam, we just didn't have it. We was in North Carolina. And the brother said, will you come have lunch with me? Single man. Business man. i tell you something. God's got people everywhere with money. He said, can you bring your family? And I'll be honest with you. Miss Tanya, I thought it's going to be awkward for Amber to go to lunch with a bunch of men. I said, yes, sir, I can. Amber's like, he says, she says, is it just him? I said, it's just him. 
So he said, meet me at this address. We pulled up and it said the name of this man's business. I didn't know he knew our business. The David. So I went inside. I said, we're here. He said, can you come to my office? Walked in. This man's got eight or ten CPAs that work for him. Got a big tax firm. They do 8,500 tax returns a year. Big, big business. He said, do you mind if I give Noah something? I said, I said, no, sir. He said, it's something big. I said, well, what is it? He said, my truck. I said, do what? He said, that 2012 four-wheel drive Z71, four-door, LTZ, black leather interior. (laughs) I said, are you serious? He said, I'm dead serious. He said, last year y'all came to our church. He said, I parked beside y'all, and he's got a Yukon XL Denali that he normally drives. But he bought that truck in 2012. And he actually drove that truck that night. He said, I got out, and Noah said, hey, brother, that's a nice truck. He said, you like that truck, Noah? He said, that's a nice truck. He said, I'm going to give that truck to you. We didn't think nothing about it. I didn't even really hear him say it, Kendall. So he said, invite your family in. So they walked in. We walked through the back kitchen. We walked out the back door. It was an awkward feeling. Because receiving is awkward. It ought to be. If you enjoy receiving more than you do giving, you've got issues. Because the blessing is in giving. <laughs> it's more blessed to give. <laughs> we walked outside, Nicholas. And by the way, thank you for taking no fishing today. I mean that. That meant a lot to Noah. I got a FaceTime call. Daddy caught my biggest bass. Now, I know y'all guesstimated at six pounds, but it looked about four to me. I'm just being honest. <laughs> but I'll let him say ten if he wants to. And I want to thank you. Because you're part of God's people that do them special things. And I thank you for that. So we walked outside. Family walked outside awkward. You know, kind of looking around. I'm looking at Amber about to bust. He said, uh, no, you remember that truck? No, I said, yes, sir. He said, Noah caught the keys, Kendall. He said, it's yours. Noah looked at me. He said, go get in it, boy. We got in it, opened the door. The back seat don't even look like it's ever been sitting. One owner. He said, what's that? That's, that's God's people. <laughs> I remember reading a verse that said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things, these things, these four-wheelers, these tractors. You say, oh, that's carnal. Might be to you, but it meant something to me. These trucks. God's people. (laughs) God's people has been good to us. But with Tim, God's used His people to supply needs and wants a lot. And if I continue telling stories before I leave here, you're going to be jealous of me tonight. Because God's been so good to us. And it hurts my feelings sometimes. This week while I'm here, a man is pouring footings around our double wide. And a church in North Carolina bought brick and they're going to come underpin. Nice brick front porch. I put a deer cam. I'm a redneck. We ain't got no ring. We got deer cameras that send us pictures. Can I get a witness? I put one heading at my front gate. Look at David. I sent a picture to Amber yesterday morning while we was in church. (laughs) I'm sorry. When I need to quit, you cut my mic off and I'll sit down. I sent Amber this picture yesterday. See that concrete truck backing in my yard? I don't mean much to y'all, but it does to us. <laughs> While I'm here, there's some of God's people working on our property. Ain't much. It's a double wide sitting on property. It looks like redneck.com and we love it. Talk to me now. Somebody said, Brother Josh, you got property. Y'all going to build a house? I said, no, I got a mansion. They said, in Louisiana? I said, oh, no. Up there. (laughs) My house may not look like 
a castle and my clothes may be lacking in style. And if you come and sit at my table, a meager supply you might find. But oh, it's not what you see that makes me a king. Makes me a king. To me, I've everything, all that I need, all that I need, treasures unseen. If you'll go all the way with God. (laughs) Noah, go all the way with God, son. Go all the way with God. Dakota, go all the way, buddy. Jonah, go all the way. Carter, go all the way with God, son. And he'll give you unction. Oh, he'll give it to you, son. Noah, go all the way with God, buddy. Go all the way. There ain't a better life in this world. I got an electrical engineering degree. 23 boys, I walked away from it. My last year working, as me and my wife. I made $145,000 at 23 years old. And I've got more now than I've had then. Are you listening to me? There's no telling. I'm tired of seeing boys like y'all walk off. I'm tired of it. There's no sense in it. Are you listening to me? Y'all ran the other night. Y'all keep running. Y'all go run right now. No, go run with them, son. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah to God. Are you listening to me? Run together. My preacher said, find somebody who's got it, run alongside them and get it. Run, boys! Run! God's people. Carter, go run with them. Langston boys, go run with them. Go run with them, boys. Go ahead, Jonah. Go ahead, Noah. Go ahead. Go ahead, boys. Run. Any of you other boys want to run? Go ahead, Brother Adam. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. (laughs) Going all the way with God. (laughs) Hallelujah. God's people. God will use His people. you got to go all the way with Him. I don't know what God's done in your heart tonight. My burden has left me, but I want to tell you something tonight. You won't need nobody else to turn and go back. Don't need nobody to turn and go back. You need to go all the way. There's going to be famines. But don't worry. They ain't never killed nobody. There was going to be a drought, a famine of water. Miss Tanya, if you'd come. Thank you, sis, for going to take care of your mama the last couple of days. In 30-something years, she's never missed a camp meeting. She was torn because her mama was in the hospital. We just happened to be there at their house Sunday afternoon when she called Miss Lori. I ain't trying to embarrass her, but I want to tell her thank you for honoring your mother and father. I bless the Lord. I, I turn around, I, brother, brother David. I love to hear you play, but I'm sorry she's got you beat on congregations, brother. I turn around, brother Ben. I said, boy, she can play the piano. And thank you. I mean that. I appreciate your sacrifice. <laughs> Somebody done found the rock altar out there. Sounds like unction, Carter. Some of y'all need to make a decision just to go on with God. Some of y'all are here, but you're really in Moab. Are you listening to me? Some of y'all are looking towards Moab. It looks greener. It don't look like there's a famine there. 
I got news for you. You better hang out where you're supposed to be. If your little boy was here tonight, he'd be running with them. Oh, yeah, he'd probably done ran before they started. Brother Daniel, there's a lot against you. There's a whole lot more for you. <laughs> Some of y'all looking toward Moab. Don't, don't, don't even look toward that way. Say, so, but Josh, they're talking about a famine coming. Well, you better hang out. Better hang out where the famine's going. Elijah, they said, ain't going to be no rain. The Lord said, I need you to go to a brook, Cherith. I'm going to provide for you there. Sometimes God will separate you. Put you all in a lonely place, Brother Tim. That's what He'll do. But He'll provide. Then God said, I'm, I'm going to send you to a little widow woman in Zarephath. Now you'd think that God had sent him to a rich widow woman. Nope, He sent him to a poor one. And she didn't even have enough for her and her son. But you know what she did? She gave it to God and gave it to the man of God. That's why you're always supposed to take care of the man of God. Talk to me now. Always take care of the man of God. We, my family had helped a pastor start a church in Hammond, Louisiana, Bible Baptist Church. And there was a week, Brother David, where they was either going to pay the power bill or pay the preacher. And the men said, we're going to pay the preacher. We can have church without power, but we can't have church without the preacher. Amen. The lady in the community stopped by and dropped off a $3,500 tithe check. She didn't have no church to go to. They couldn't find that woman again. It's probably an angel unaware. Talk to me now. <laughs> Sis, you wasn't there about two months ago. Miss Deanne, is that your name? We dropped in your Papa's church. I think it was your husband took us out to supper. I could be wrong. Maybe. Somebody took us out to supper. Does your little sister sing? Okay. They was there and she sang that night. I'd hauled my camper to Lakeland for Brother Colt Diamond starting that church. But David, we had hauled down there. I didn't tell nobody I'd canceled. Cost me about six hundred dollars to pull that camper down there and fuel. And I was broke. Colt was starting that church and I didn't want to say nothing to him, Brother Tim, but I was broke. I might have had enough diesel to get back. We got there where they were supposed to have the camper plug. They didn't have the power turned on, and so I had to get a hotel. The hotel in in Lakeland, Florida was two hundred and fifty nine dollars a night. So I got the first night. And that's all I had, Ben. We went to her grandpa's church. Didn't know him from Adam's house cat. But we went on Wednesday night and we had church just like we're having tonight. Just like it. He walked up and handed me a $500 check. He said, I don't even know your name, brother, so I left the name blank. So said, what's that? That's God's people. That's God's provision. Absolutely. Every time. I ain't going to ramble tonight. I don't know what you need. Stand all over the building. If you need to be saved, you come. If you need to get right, if you need to come back to Bethlehem, you come. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you. Oh, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your people. (laughs) Thank you for your provisions. Thank you for your power. Lord, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to Moab. (laughs) You've been so good to me in Bethlehem, Judea. I don't want to go nowhere, God. I want to thank you, God, for who you are and what you do. Bless us in your name, we pray.